So we've been using the Gospel of Matthew as a starting point for our series. Uh, Hollywood Christian School, our vision is that we'll become a catalyst for world-class kingdom-centered education. And so um, if we're going to become a kingdom-centered uh, school, then we have to understand and know the kingdom. And it is my desire and my plan to teach you and train you concerning the kingdom of God. Amen. All right. So today we're going to skip ahead just a little bit and we're going to look at a very powerful parable called the parable of the sower. If you've been reading the Bible for any number of years, this is probably a parable that's already familiar with you. Uh, but I want to start with this, and this is one of my favorite ones because of the principles that we pull from this particular parable. And it's in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 3. It says, And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Jesus went on for just very briefly. He began to explain to his disciples why he taught so much in parables. And the good thing about the parable of the sower is that Jesus then began to give us an interpretation of the parable. So we don't even have to interpret it ourselves. Jesus did that for us. He said in verse 22, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and proves it unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, I'm sorry, I skipped a little bit, I'm sorry. Verse 18, let me back up. Verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So Jesus indicating just from his interpretation that this parable has to do with the kingdom of God and receiving the understanding of the kingdom of God when it's being taught. Verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Now, last week we started talking about persecution as well. This is why you have to be prepared for persecution. Just because you receive a word with excitement, just because you get a little bit of understanding, doesn't mean that everything is going to, from that point on, become easy for you. There has to be some working in that process in order to become an effective, mature kingdom citizen in the kingdom of God. So we have to expect that there are going to be some struggle, some straining, some working hard to get to where God wants us to be, even after we have heard his word. And that's why we talked about that. And then we move into verse 22. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So there you have somebody who gets the word of God in them, but because they're more concerned about people, about things, about places, about accomplishing their own goal, the word is not as fruitful in their lives as it should be because of the things that they are trying to do out in the world. It says in verse 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another sixty and another thirty. So you had several different types of soil that this seed fell on it, the soil was going. Some of it fell out of his pocket on his way to go into the field or fell out of his bag on his way of going to the field. The Bible says those are like the ones who fell along the path. That ground of going to the field is hard and, it's, and it's, 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 there's no way that the seed can take root in that particular ground. And the Bible says that the birds came and just swiped those seeds up and ate them. Jesus said that those are like people who they hear the word of the kingdom, but they don't get any understanding of it at all. And they're like, the Satan just comes and snatch what they've learned off of their minds because they failed to completely get understanding. And then he said that there were those who 
fell among rocky soil. Uh, in the fields in those days, there was a hardened part of the field that was oftentimes the areas where the people would walk on as they went out sowing those seeds. And that part was so hard and packed down that it was just like rock. And if any seed fell on it, it would be just like a seed falling on a regular rock on the ground. But it, there was no depth there. So whenever the seed would begin to grow, its roots would be very shallow and it didn't have deep roots in the soil. And so that would be fine for a moment and that would make it grow up very quickly. But the problem is because it had no roots, whenever the sun would come out, it withered away. Jesus said those are like people who hear the word of God and they receive it and they get excited about it and they want more and more of it. But they still fail to get deeper understanding of what they are so excited about. And whenever hard times come, Jesus says those people fade away. They can't handle the persecution. They can't handle what comes with the package. And then he said that there were those seeds that fell among the thorns. There were weeds in these fields as well. So some of the seeds would get, would get fallen amidst the, the, the weeds and the thorns that would be there in that field. And, and the thing about that seed, Jesus says, is that that seed would grow up. But as it began to grow up, it would get entangled with the weeds and the thorns around it. And from that point on, its growth would be hindered and you could barely tell any difference between it and the weeds around it. Jesus said that those are like people who are caught up in the world. They know God. They want God. But when they grow, they try to entangle God's principles and ideas mixed in with things that don't belong. And that person will never grow fully because they're still trying to hang on to God and the world. And we've already talked about that. That just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so those people, Jesus said, like the seed that fell among the thorns, they grew up, but their growth was choked and they were hindered. And then finally, he said that there were those seeds that fell on good soil. And those seeds that fell on good soil, they were planted. They had good roots. They were watered. They were taken care of. And they began to grow. And some of those seeds produced 30 fold the seed that was put in. Some produced 60. Some reproduced 100 fold. He said that those are people who when that, they not only hear the word of God, but they get a deeper understanding of the word of God. And they do and they live and they pursue the word of God with their whole entire heart. Those people, Jesus says, grow up and begin to produce fruit. So the key and the determining factor here is understanding. It's not enough for us to just talk about the kingdom. It's not enough to just go around with this label of the kingdom. In order for us to truly be effective and in order for us to really see the results that God has for our lives, we have to have understanding of the kingdom of God. And that takes a little bit of work on our parts. You can't get an understanding just by sitting up listening to a message. You can't get an understanding just by sitting down and reading a book. In order to get an understanding, there's some work we have to do on our parts to work out that understanding and make it effective and be a wisdom and knowledge in our lives. And that's the thing I want to explore. In Mark chapter 4, verse 13, here's what Jesus said about this parable. He said, and he said unto them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? So what Jesus was saying at this point is he was saying that in order for you to get anything I teach you, you got to understand this parable of the sower. He said, if you want to get any principle of the kingdom of God, you got to get this principle that comes from this parable. He said, if you can get this, you can get them all because this parable is principle to understanding all the other parables. So there's something key, there's something fundamental about this parable that if we can glean from it, it can help us to understand everything else. That makes sense. So this is the parable of parables. This is the important one. We got to get this one. So let's break it down. Let's make it plain. Now, one thing I want to do is I want to pull back just a little bit and be a little bit more broader and a little bit more practical in this session today. Uh, because I, I think there are some things that you can obviously get from this scripture because Jesus has already interpreted it. But I also believe that there are some practical things that we can pull from it as well. So here's one thing we have to know going forward. The parable of the sower is a foundational parable. So by understanding it, we gain the fundamental fundamentals of effectiveness in the kingdom. Now, I emphasize that word foundational and fundamental because that means that these are just the beginning things. These are just seeds. This is just the start of the process. So in other words, it's not going to give you everything you need, 
but it's going to give you the beginning, the foundation of what you need toward understanding the kingdom of God. So it's the fundamental things that matter. This is foundation. So we have to get it in order to get all the other stuff. So there, there are five keys to effective kingdom living that I want to pull from this parable and share with you this morning. And here's the first one. The first one is this. One thing we obviously see from this parable is that you have to continually seek God. If, if you want to be effective, you want to be an effective kingdom citizen, you have to continually seek God. Now, I use that word intentionally because there's the word continually and there's the word continuously. There's a difference between the two. The word continuous means that I start, I stop, I start, I stop. There's all these pauses in between. But the word continually means that I'm going to start doing it and I'm just going to keep on going. I'm just going to keep on doing it. There won't be any stops in between. It's just going to be a perpetual process of me seeking after God. So in our lives, we have to continually seek after God. Now, that is, does that mean that we don't have seasons that are dry, where I, I may not be the way I want to be? No, we're going to have those seasons. The Bible says we have in-season, we have out-of-season experiences. That's not what I mean. But there's that continual forefront in our minds where we are always pursuing God and going after him and everything that we do. We have to continually be seeking God. Uh, uh, Proverbs 25 and 2 says this, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. God will intentionally hide stuff in life for the purpose of you going through the process of seeking it out. David said in Psalm 105, he said, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence, what? Continually. He said, seek the presence of God continually. Then he said in Psalm 63, he said, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Now, this, this scripture interprets it a little bit differently than other ones. But what David was really saying in that scripture, he was saying, God, early, early do I seek after you. All right, David is saying the very first thing, my top priority, my top priority is to get to you. We have to learn to seek the face of God before we seek the hand of God. We need to seek God's presence, not just always seeking God's help. We talked about this one time before when it comes to prayer. We don't just go to God to ask for things. That, that's very ineffective because most of the things you need, God already knows you have need of them. What you need more than anything is the presence of God. Jesus put it this way. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all the things will be added unto you. Here's the second thing. Second thing toward becoming an effective citizen is that you need to nurture your gifts. You need to identify and nurture and grow your gifts. Every person in this room is gifted with something. Everybody in this room has been blessed by God to accomplish a purpose. And when he blessed you to accomplish that purpose, he equipped you with what you need to carry it out. So every last person in this room, regardless of how you feel about yourself, You've been gifted by God to accomplish something, and you have to figure it out. You have to discover what it is that God has placed inside of you to make you become who he has designed you to become. And when you discover that, you have to nurture it. Some of us try to take the easy road in life. We try to find the stuff that's easiest for us to do, and we hold on to that, and we claim that because it's easy. I had a friend once tell me that if everything were easy, the impossible would never be done. It wasn't easy sending a man to the moon. It was hard. It was complicated. It cost a lot of money. But somebody somewhere decided that as difficult as this is, as impossible as people say it is, we're still going to make it happen. And they put their efforts, they put their resources, they put their time, they put their talents into making it possible, and it happened, and now we've gone even farther than that. So you have to learn to nurture your gift. Here's a fact. Whatever you feed in your life will grow. Whatever you feed will grow. If you feed the flesh, the flesh will grow. In other words, your, your desires, your, your passions that are not appropriate, 
the inappropriate things in your mind, the lustful things you want to do. If you feed that stuff, that stuff will grow. If you feed the spirit, the spirit will grow. If you feed, if you do the things that are necessary to help you grow spiritually and help you grow closer to God, your spirit will grow. If you feed your gifts, your gifts will grow. I had somebody tell me that one of the richest places on earth is the graveyard. One of the richest places on earth is the graveyard. Why? Because so many people die and go to the grave without ever discovering and using their gifts. Your, your wealth, your success, whatever you need in life is tied up in your gifts. Some of us never discover them. Some of us never work on them. Some of us never develop them. Some of us never take the time to do that because when you're first developing something, it's difficult. And if we get discouraged by things that are difficult, we'll never accomplish a thing that other people say are impossible. You have to nourish your gifts. You have to continue to work it. Paul told Timothy this in Timothy chapter one, verse six. He said, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that's that word power again. Remember, power properly defined is the ability to achieve purpose. God has given you a spirit of power. God has given you the attitude, a mindset that is necessary to accomplish what he's called you to in life. If he's called you to it, he has equipped you for it. Here's the third thing I would say. Third key to being effective in the kingdom of God is don't just grow. Dominate. Be excessive. You know, being a school, we talk so much about learning. We talk so much about growing. We talk so much about developing. But, but there's another level to that. There's a level beyond just growing and learning all the time. That's dominating. It means I, I don't just do enough to get by. I don't just do enough to simply be labeled as successful. I want to dominate the whole entire thing. What, what field has God called you to? What, what industry has he called you to? What, what, what has he done or shown you that you're to accomplish with your life? Whatever that area is, God doesn't just want you to be in it. God wants you to dominate it. God wants you to completely influence the whole entire thing. Now, dominating doesn't mean I'm the big mouth boss. That's not what dominating means. Dominating does not mean I'm just going around telling people what to do. Dominating means that I am in a position where I can be of influence wherever I am. Wherever I am, I can be of influence for the kingdom of God. Wherever I am, I can give him glory in my work. Wherever I am, I am in a position where I can influence what happens in whatever field I'm in. My goal is not simply to run a school in life. That's nice, and I enjoy it, but that's not where my life ends. My goal is not simply to dominate uh, the field of education. That's, that's nice, and, and it's wonderful, and I am positioning myself to be influenced there. That's nice. You know what my ultimate goal in life is? is to continue to lead you after I'm dead. My ultimate goal is to lead from the grave. Now, how do I do that? That means I have to leave a legacy behind where people continue to live out the things I have taught them to do even after I'm gone. That's my goal in life. I want to lead from the grave. I want to be a generational leader. I don't want to just lead you. I want to lead your grandkids and your great-grandkids and your great-great-grandkids, long after I'm gone, they don't have to mention my name, but I just have to put something in enough people's heart to make them carry it on after I am gone. That's my ultimate goal in life. I want to completely dominate, not just my generation, but the ones after me too. So we have to dominate wherever we go. So don't just grow, dominate, be excessive. Here's the thing, God has given you dominion power. He's not just giving you any kind of power. It's not just some dinky power. 
God has given you dominion power. He has given you the ability to completely influence the atmosphere of where you are. You have been given that by God and you experience it too. Most of you in this room don't like to always be told what to do. Most of you in this room feel trapped when you cannot do what is on your heart and on your mind to do. Most of you get stressed out when you feel like you're being limited, when you feel like you've been treated unfairly, you can't stand it. Because there's something inside of you that says that you don't like to be locked down. You can't stand it. That something in you is the dominion power that God has given you to carry out his will in your life. Now, what happens is for a season, you have to be under a governor. You have to be under a tutor. You have to be taught discipline. You have to be taught self-control. You have to be taught patience. You have to be taught wisdom. You have to be taught knowledge. You have to be taught understanding. So there's a season of your life where if you were to use that power inappropriately, you can harm more people than you help. So you have to be taught how to have the right attitude and the right mindset in order to use that as a good steward. Here's something else. Whenever you learn, learn excessively. If you haven't figured it out, it's all about excess. In, in the kingdom of God, we, we don't want to barely get by. But whenever we learn, we learn excessively. When you're learning stuff in the classroom, don't just learn what you have to learn to take a test. Man, that's petty. Anybody can do that. But you always learn for mastery. And let me tell you something. If you want to learn to master what you're learning in class, your standards will have to exceed those of your teachers. I'm telling you, if you really want to master what you're doing, your expectations for yourself has to be higher than theirs. Because in order to really master something, you've got to want it from within yourself. You can't wait for other people to say, here, Here's what you need to match. No, you have to figure it out for yourself. You have to have a desire and a drive from within you that says, I'm going to get this and I want it bad enough to go through whatever I've got to go through in order to make it happen. I just want it. I just want it. And I don't want it for anybody else right now. This is just what I have to have for me. Just got to want it. Learn excessively. You know, as I reflect on my life, and I was always a straight-A student in school. I worked my rear end off to get there. It didn't come to me easily. But I can tell you this. As I look back over my life, I, I don't remember once my mama telling me, go do your homework. I don't ever remember my mama telling me, go study. I, I don't ever remember any of that. The only thing I remember my mama telling me is that she would get my report card, I would have straight A's, and she'd make this one statement, you can do better. You can do better. There's always another level. My mama wasn't being mean. She didn't hurt my feelings. She challenged me. And it's through that challenging me that I learned to challenge myself. Learn excessively. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 5 says this. A wise man is full of strength. Everybody say full. It didn't say a wise man has half strength. It didn't say a wise man has little strength. It says a wise man is full full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. Become people of knowledge. Become a man or become a woman of knowledge. Always growing, always learning. Here's something else. Constantly push your own boundaries. Constantly push your own boundaries. When I recognize that I am getting close to accomplishing a goal, I'm already thinking about the next one. You know, some of my friends and even some of my family chastised me because I didn't celebrate it when I got my doctorate degree. That's a big deal, by the way. It's, it's, it's big. It's not easy to get that. Not everybody can do it. But I had some people get on to me because I did not celebrate the receiving of my doctoral degree. And it wasn't intentional. It wasn't that I just sat at home and said, no, I don't want to celebrate. I, don't, I, I, didn't, I wasn't acting all stink. That wasn't the problem. The thing for me was that I was so focused on the next thing that I just didn't stop and take the time <laughs> to celebrate it. 
So my family had to do it for me. They had to do whatever it took to get me to stop and to celebrate it because I was already thinking about the next thing that I was going to do. When I saw myself approaching that finish line, I was already focused on the next one. So every time you accomplish one goal, you got to already be setting your mind on something else. So constantly push your boundaries. Here's another one. Take advantage of time that other people waste. You ought to put a star beside that one. Take advantage of time that other people waste. And, and I'm telling you that, that that's critical. Because when you grow up and you're constantly around lazy people, lazy people waste a lot of time. Lazy people procrastinate. They tend to wait until the very last minute to do stuff. Take advantage of, other time, of time that other people waste. When, when other people are taking a break, work. When other people are on vacation, work. When other people are sitting around acting like they don't have anything to do, work. And don't wait for people to tell you to work. Learn how to take advantage of time that other people are wasting. I, I, I told you that it wasn't easy for me to make my grades in school. But what I discovered was that a lot of times when my friends would be sitting around wasting time, I had to have my head in a book because I wanted mastery. I didn't want to just pass a test. I wanted to really truly understand it because I had something else I wanted to do with my life. So take advantage of time that other people waste. Proverbs chapter 20 says this, the sluggard sleeps in autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. The slugger sleeps in autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Here's the fourth thing. Les Brown always says, engage in consistent action. It means when you have something you're trying to accomplish, you have to always be doing what's necessary to accomplish it. And then here's the last one. Trust God. Trust his process, because in between where you are and where you want to be and what you're trying to accomplish, even when it's for God, there will be seasons and there will be times when it feels like nothing's happening, when it looks like everything is going wrong, when it seems that there's no way possible that I am going to be able to achieve victory in this particular situation. You will have seasons like that. Hear me. But it is my faith in God. It is my belief that his process is firm and sure that keeps me going even when I feel discouraged. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this opportunity to, be able to come in and explore the concepts of your kingdom. And our Father, as we lay every teaching, as we lay every principle, as we lay every word down before you, don't let us be like the seed that fell on the wayside and the enemy came and snatched it away. Don't let us be like the seed that fell on the rocky ground and as soon as things get difficult, we give up on what you've taught us. Don't even let us be like the seed that fell among the weeds where we become so distracted by everything around us that we lose focus on you and hinder our growth. But I'm praying this morning, Father, that you will have good seed in our hearts, that you'll cultivate what we've learned, that we might grow, that we might be fruitful, and that we might be productive for your kingdom. We thank you so much, Father, and we give you praise in this day. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.